we get from here in 1960 on the left to here in 1993 on the right. This is some downtown performance uh, art group doing Yabba Dabba Q, still having a gay old time. You know, in 1960, the word gay meant happy, have a fun time. In 1971, when Hanna-Barbera did a new Flintstone show called uh, Pebbles and Bam Bam, they changed it to you'll have a groovy time. Here we are back in 1994, the new movie's out, we still hear you'll have a gay old time, but everybody says it now with a wink in their eye. What we're here to find out basically is, how do we result in an image like this? What is it about the Flintstones that has entered popular culture? What is it about the Flintstones that we know and love? Uh, one thing that I want to talk about is, we're here to talk about the original 1960s television series. We're not here to discuss the new movie, regardless of what anybody thinks about or if anybody's seen it. We're not here to discuss the merchandising that's been done in the Flintstones that everybody knows. We are Flintstone kids. I hate that song. <laughs> We're not here to discuss what is absolutely a weird cereal if anybody's ever had this stuff. We're not here to discuss Fruity Pebbles. We're here to find out what it is that makes the Flintstones tick. What is it that allows the Flintstones to enter the New York Times crossword puzzle? Or even the New York Times magazine itself? This was last year. And not only respected magazines like New York Times, but I mean it's even featured in the latest issue of Screw Magazine. <laughs> Here we are, and if anybody can see, you know, butt rock over there, and I blacked out some of the more, uh, you know, imposing areas there. But uh, basically, the Flintstones has entered, you know, the fine art world. Here's a painting by Kenny Scharf in 1982 that he calls love. So we're here to find out and peel off the kind of dark underbelly of the Flintstones and find out what it is that we love about them to this day. Now, of course, we must go back to the very beginning. We know that the Flintstones was a Hanna-Barbera production. Joseph Hanna and William Barbera started their careers designing animation, and they're most well-known for the famous uh, Tom and Jerry shorts that won Oscars for them in the 40s. This was beautifully produced you know, uh, animation during the golden age of the era that was on the level of uh, Walt Disney. But what happened was in the late 50s, just like film television, uh, live television was dying on the East Coast, animation was dying, everything was moving to Los Angeles, becoming shorter, tighter, television was taking over the movie business, and MGM closed their offices in 1957 because it became too expensive to produce cartoons. So what Hannah Barbera did was, with their producer, Fred Quimby, in the middle, they decided to proposed six-minute cartoons for television at a cost of $3,000 a piece, which was at the time less than one-tenth of what it cost to do one of their Tom and Jerry shorts. And the first series that they sold was called Rough and Ready, and that hit in late 1957, and the success of Rough and Ready led to that oh-so-merry Huckleberry. Huckleberry Hound was a big hit in 1958, and one of the side characters of Huckleberry Hound, who actually uh, emerged as a bigger star than Huckleberry was Hey Boo Boo! The Yogi Bear. And in fact, the Yogi Bear Boo Boo relationship is very, you know, Fred Barney-esque, if you think about it. As is the relationship between Quickstraw and Baba Louie, or as Howard Stern would say, Baba Booey. But anyway, these were successes, and with these successes in 1958 and 59, Hanna-Barbera wondered what could they do next. Well, at the urging of their partners, Screen Gems, they said, why don't you do a full-length animated series for television, the first of its kind. So Hanna-Barbera, you know, put their brains together, and they decided, well, at that time in 1959, the two most successful family-oriented sitcoms had ended their network runs. I Love Lucy was done by 1957 or 58 or so. Uh, the 39 episodes of The Honeymooners that we all know finished in um, 1956. So these were classics even at that time, and they decided, well, we don't want to do an animated series that takes place in present time, but what we'll do is we'll take this idea, both of these shows were set in New York, even though I Love Lucy was filmed in Hollywood, they were very New York series. As we all know, I Love Lucy was always traveling to Hollywood. Uh, they never made it out of Brooklyn. I don't know if they ever made it out of the uh, stoop there. But basically, just like the rest of the country was moving to Los Angeles, the Giants, the Dodgers, everything was moving. Live television was moving to the West Coast. So they decided, we'll set our series here in California, but instead of in the present time, let's set it in a different time. They tried Roman era, they tried a kind of a pirate type atmosphere, they tried a few different historical times, nothing worked until they came upon the idea of doing it in prehistoric times. 
So what they basically did was they designed bedrock and they decided to take off on the whole move to suburbia in the, uh, in the late 50s and early 60s. And that's, you know, one of the basic appeals about the Flintstones was it was where America was in 1960. They dubbed their show, the proposal was the Gladstones, and Ed Benedict, their designer who designed all those other Hanna-Barbera series, came up with this, one of the very early drawings, Fred, Barney, Wilma, and believe it or not, that was a character proposed called Fred Jr. Where Barney is, I mean, where um, Betty is, we don't know. They produced a, um, a two-minute uh, video piece, a proposal to take around to ad agencies and places for uh, seed money. They couldn't use the Gladstone's name, it turns out, because there were copyright infringement things. So they called their proposal the Flagstones, and we're going to take a look at it now. I serve His Majesty's lunch. He's dining at pool today. Where's Barney? He's trying on his gear. Gear? That's right. He's going to practice spear fishing in the pool. Spear fishing? Well, Mom. Um, I'll be right back. I've got to feed the fish. What do you want, it, friend? I uh, just sat down and I want to reach it. And remember, if you sing, don't let my best dishes go down with the ship. <laughs> Barney, it's you. Uh, did my spirit fish out of the scare you? Out of my wits. And don't scare Fred, or you'll lose his lunch and my dishes. Hiya, Fred. And uh, what are you made up for? I'm going to practice spirit fishing. Oh, you can't lose. You'll either spare them or they'll die laughing. How does it work? And don't point that thing at me. It's loud. Oops. Bonnie boy, you are making it tough to be friends. No use wasting the lunch. <laughs> first character that we see, Betty, probably underwent the most change from what we know that later ended up being the third episode of the Flintstones called The Swimming Pool. The voice of Betty, if anybody recognized that, was the voice of the famous June Foray, who was the voice of Rocket J. Squirrel. Wilma basically survived pretty much intact. She was a little bit ragged, her bun, I don't know, her clothing's a little bit different. Fred basically, again, is the same, although keep watch of his hairdo. It changes throughout the series, as does Barney's, although Barney, again, from the uh, proposal to the finish, was pretty much right on the money. Now, the whole very idea of setting an animated series in prehistoric times basically came out of the comics. I mean, Alley Oop was a famous comic strip that debuted in 1934 by the artist V.T. Hamlin, and that, just like the Flintstones, had to do with a caveman dealing with kind of modern day problems. Even in comic books, uh, we had the idea of uh, prehistoric times updated. Here's um, Lois Lane writing the Stone Age News. So the fact that the Flintstones did it isn't all that original, but the biggest comic strip influence on the Flintstones has to be a very unacknowledged influence, but if I were Johnny Hart, the creator of BC, in 1958, two years before both their Flagstones pilot and the debut, I'd be a little bit upset because everybody credits the Honeymooners for the Flintstones influence. What about BC? I mean, here he says, BC, are you for real? What are you? The caveman's thinking man's caveman? A Neanderthal nebbish? Bone Age beatnik? Or what? One of Hart's descriptions of BC, the main character, is a humble, meek, kind, naive slob. Pretty much a description of Barney Rubble. His partner, Fred, well, Fred is basically a combination of three other BC characters. You have Peter, who's described by Hart as a self-styled genius, the world's first philosophical failure. We have Curls, a master of sarcastic wit. And Thor, inventor, artist, ladies' man, the inventor of the wheel and the comb. And we can see <laughs> Thor's influence on the Flintstones in this very early BC strip. And the girls, I don't know if the BC ever had names for the girls, but basically, uh, you know, they're Wilman Bay. So, the Flagstone's name also couldn't be used because yet another comic strip influence, 
Mark Walker and Dick Brown's High Lois, their name were the Flagstones. So they couldn't use that. They dubbed them the Flintstones, and in 1960, September 30th, the Flintstone debuted. Here's the fall preview issue from that week, and they had a double-page spread article. And you can see the kind of atmosphere that made the Flintstones such an oddity at the time, the first full-length animated series in prime time at night. And why did the Flintstones sell? Well, the comment of the sponsor's representative who made the decision to buy it, this sounds like it was torn from today's headlines. He said, well, at least it doesn't have blood and guts running in the alley. So obviously it was a concern even back then. Let's take a look at the very first thing viewers saw on the night of September 30th, 8.30 p.m. season for the Flintstones. 1661 was this opening, not in black and white. That's the only print that actually survives. It wasn't full color. The first time we see the Flintstones, the show opens up, we see the sort of weird kind of igloo-shaped hovel, and we meet Fred. And as we can see from a close-up of Fred, he basically is an animated version of Jackie Gleason. Ralph Fran, I mean, even at one point in the series, Fred was a bus driver. Fred had all the um, emotions and attitudes. He is Ralph Cramden. Ralph had a big mouth. Fred had a big mouth. But just like Ralph, he felt remorse for his actions. And so did Fred too. In fact, Fred felt a very particular kind of animated guilt. When I saw this image, all I can think of was, could it possibly be that Magritte was working at Hanna-Barbera? In 1960? In fact, a current cartoonist, John Kelly, a couple years ago, did a strip called Overlooked Art Classics of the Modern Stone Age. He called this one The Flintstone by Rene McGravel. He took the famous Les Mademoiselles d'Avignon and called it Les Pebbles d'Avignon by Rocco Picasso. I can see the whole room, and there's nothing, nobody in it became. I can see the whole rubble by Roy Lichtenstone, and there's no Barney in it. <laughs> of course, Sorry Night became, by Vincent Van Stone, Barney Night. In fact, the first time we see Barney in the very first episode of the Flintstones, he's golfing, which again was a big feature of the BC comic strip. They were always playing golf. Another feature that we saw in the very first episode called the Flintstone Flyer, again inspired by C, they were always doing wacky Stone Age contraptions and Barney had the Flintstone Flyer. Barney, again, just like, just like Fred, was Ed Norton of the Honeymooners. The most distinguishing aspect of Barney that we all remember to this day, what was going on with his eyes? You know, he had circles, he had weird eyes. This is a sort of later model Barney. The last season of Flintstones, he finally sort of graduated to black eyes. But that's about it for Barney. Not too much is known about him. Then we have the girls. Of course, Betty and Wilma, they're, you know, Alice and Trixie. They're also, of course, the counterparts of the classic, you know, duos of pop culture because they were always gabbing on their Stone Age telephones. But again, Wilma and Betty are like any of the classic pop culture duos. They're Betty and Veronica. They're even kind of a Lana Lang, Lois Lane duo. 
So what is it about Betty and Wilma that we know and love? A couple years ago, somebody took a poll, I forget where this was, but they wanted to know, who would you rather go to bed with? Betty or Wilma? Now why is it that hands down, like 10 to 1, Betty won out? What is it about Betty that makes her more attractive to us than Wilma. You know, Wilma tried to be a little bit sexy, but as you can see, Wilma tried too hard. Betty was demure. Betty, just by being Betty, had this sort of come-hither look. Betty was what you would call fetching, okay? They both had, they both could sing, they both had personalities, but while Wilma, you know, sung her heart out here, Betty pulled more of a Michelle Pfeiffer, fabulous Baker Boys kind of thing over here with his weird white wig. They were both on TV at one point. Make your hobby hubby, keep your hubby happy. When he's a little chubby, he's a happy pappy. With rock and spiel. And I think Betty was doing some sort of, uh, you know, soft soap or something about her hands. I don't know, maybe a clue can be found in their relationships with their husbands. Now, Fred and Wilma, just like Jackie uh, Gleason, and uh, Audrey Meadows were always at each other's throats, although Fred would never lay a hand on Wilma. This is about as antagonistic as they got. While this was going on, Betty was a geisha girl for Barney. <laughs> you know, the honeymooners to, to deflate, uh, you know, Ralph's way would always poke fun, so did, you know, so did Wilma. But while Wilma was pointing out Fred's way, Betty was carrying Barney's weight in some weird kind of relationship going on there. You know, again, the honeymooners, they always ended with a kiss, and the Flintstones always ended with a kiss, although Wilma would really smack a big kisser, but Betty and Barney, the most you got to see was something like this. Always a little obscure. Now, after the kiss, what then went on? Well, listen, we never saw what went on after the kiss. Just like many 50s families, they slept in separate beds. Although, by the later part of the Flintstones, they were actually sleeping together. Now, the most we ever saw Barney and Betty in bed was Barney alone. Where was Betty? <laughs> now, maybe it's because they slept together that in the end, it was Wilma who could have a baby while poor Baron Betty. <laughs> so, in the end, Wilma might be seen as the perfect wife, but therefore, there's nothing mysterious about her while Betty remains an enigma. <laughs> now maybe a clue to Betty's appeal can be found by John Kelly, the same cartoonist who did um, the Overlooked Art Classics. He did a comic strip called Bad Betty in the same issue as Overlooked Art Classics and it went something like this. I was on my way down to the candy store when I noticed Joe Rockhead's door was open. He said, hello there, you sure look pretty this morning. Then he put his hands on my chest. Something came over me and I pulled my hatchet out of my bag and hit him on the head. He fell. He made awful gurgling noises and the blood splattered my dress. I hit him again and stopped the noises. I went home and soaked my dress, otherwise it would have been ruined. Then I went to bed. The next morning, I went down to the candy store. When I got down there, the fellow behind the counter said, Did you hear about the old man? I asked, What old man? He said, Old Joe. He got his brains knocked out. I started to laugh. He then said, what's the matter with you? Are you crazy? I said, no, it just struck me sort of funny. You see, fellas have been doing stuff like this to me for years. All my life I felt like people were watching me, like I was just some gal on the TV. All these eyes staring at me, studying every move I made. And here I'd gone and done something that no one knew I'd done. I felt free for the first time. I felt like a real person. Any more questions? Yeah, Betty, I got a question. Is it true that you and Wilma were dominatrixes? In fact, is it true that you and Wilma were lesbians? Betty and Wilma would say, what? What are you talking about? They would tell me right away, listen, most cartoon characters were thought of as being gay. According to Jules Fife and the great comic book heroes, but, uh, you know, Dick Grayson, come on. Wonder Woman, lesbian. University of Chicago commissioned a study two years ago. What did they come up with? Bugs Bunny's gay. What was the evidence? Look at all this. The drag that you dealt in. Now, I mean, Wilma and Betty, okay, sure, they embraced every now and then. They congratulated each other. But, I mean, if they were thought of being gay, they would have a very big laugh over this. Not to mention the idea that Fred and Barney could be gay. 
I mean, come on, what are we talking about? In the, in the late 50s, the tradition from vaudeville was always, there was always a lot of touching and feeling going on, and you know, this was no different than in the Flintstones. In fact, the very first episode, just like the early honeymooners, the Flintstones were very aggressive with each other. Fred and Barney would be hitting each other all the time, but it usually ended up in a nice, warm embrace. Over the course of the series, sometimes the embrace would wind up in one of those big, smoochy kisses. And okay, I'll admit, even Fred and Barney find some way to wind up in bed together, but so did Ricky and Fred and all those, you know, couples. And okay, yes, they dressed up in drag now and then, but I mean, come on, that doesn't mean they were gay. But why else would explain that there was a club here in New York a couple years ago called Bedrock for men only? The only men's club that I think they belonged to was the same type of men's club that the Honeymoons belonged to, Loyal Order of the Raccoons, or in this case, the very early Flintstones club was called the Loyal Order of Dinosaurs. It wasn't until later in the first season that they shifted it around to the Water Buffalo Hall and the familiar Water Buffalo hats. Something about these scenes that I love and what I love about the Flintstones, always loved about them, and I think probably deep inside you do too, is I love the fact that the Flintstones took place at night. Not only the fact was there that giddy thrill that there was a cartoon on at night instead of Saturday morning, but the evocative scenes of the Flintstones at night were very, you know, very drawing in. Um, something about this image, I'm reminded whenever I see this of the same kind of nostalgic feeling for the early 60s California car environment that George Lucas produced in American Graffiti. And these night scenes were big scenes in the Flintstones that also lay claim to another big aspect of the Flintstones was the fact that by coming out in 1960, Hanna-Barbera imbued the Flintstones with a very beatnik kind of sensibility. Hot Lips Hannigan was on the second show, and of course Fred took the mic and sang a very bizarre kind of beat version of When the Saints Go Marching In. Barney was on drums, and what was fascinating about this was that, hey, these guys had blue-collar jobs, but they were cool, they were musicians, they were hip. I mean, they would sometimes play together, sometimes Fred would be on the drums, Barney on the thing. One of the best episodes in the first season was when Fred, in a kind of an Elvis Presley sort of twist, was discovered by the Colonel and was kind of this sort of rock and roll singer named Hi-Fi. Now, while this episode, and he sang some weird song, listen to the rock, listen to the rock and burr, or something like that. It was basically Elvis Presley, but in many ways, this character went beyond the kind of rockabilly Elvis Presley look to predate the whole kind of punk look. I mean, come on, Elvis Costello. There he is. You know, and you know, Stop Magazine, a sort of downtown punk magazine in 1982, had a comic strip in it by J.D. King. He said, long ago, during the prehistoric era known as the Flintstone Age, kids invented a musical form called Fred Rock, a super group that dominated the rock scene so long they became known as dinosaurs, was called Fred Zeppelin. <laughs> and cave hippies dug the grateful Fred. And this kind of rock and roll Flintstones affiliation survives in the posters by the same guy that did the Dominatrix before, Frank Kozik. These were sort of bootleg posters. Hannah Barbera's not too happy about these, but yeah, hey, they exist and they're here, and these were for some weird uh, uh, San Francisco, well, actually, here, yeah, 6th Street, right around the corner. Even Spin Magazine, a music magazine in the mid 80s, had a Flintstones trivia contest, so that shows how the Flintstones and rock and roll have kind of merged. In addition to music, the other big appeal about the Flintstones is the fact that it was a TV show about television. They were always watching TV. <laughs> One of the first things that they saw in the Flintstones, the very first TV spoof, was a spoof of commercials called, about Mother McGuire's meatballs. Now, if anybody remembers, what was the unique selling proposition of Mother McGuire's meatballs? They don't bounce. <laughs> there you go, he remembers. And listen, making fun of commercials is no big deal because, you know, we all know that the Flintstones was brought to you by Winston Cigarettes. Let's take a look at this Winston ad. Cigarette that delivers flavor 20 times a pack. Winston's got that good to blend. 
Fred smoked cigarettes. It was an adult show. It was on at night. And hey, Fred smoked. We saw it during the series. No big deal. No big whoop. The very first television personality to appear on the Flintstones was a spoof of Ed Sullivan called Ed Sully Stone. The second TV show to make an appearance on the Flintstones in the first season, Peter Gunn became Peter Gunnite. The very first episode of the second season of Flintstones introduced the first kind of real-life character as Hoagie Carmichael, guest on the Flintstones, pretty much as himself. They didn't do a Hoagie Carmichael stone or anything. A couple of episodes after, another real-life celebrity made her appearance when Jackie Kennedy, flushed from her White House tour success, made an appearance on the Flintstones, very fleeting, as Wilma and Betty are shopping, as Jackie Kennelrock. May she rest in peace. <laughs> The Price is Right with host Bill Cullen became The Prize is Priced. The third season of The Flintstones, 1962, debuted with a spoof of Lassie that we all remember affectionately of Sassy. <laughs> and there's, of course, Dino the Pet. Ben Casey, popular ABC TV show of the time, became Ben Casement. Ben, Ben. That's about the extent of my invitation. <laughs> ben. <laughs> Perry, Ma Perry Mason, everybody remembers fondly in the episode where Bam Bam was delivered as Perry Masonary. <laughs> Bewitched, which everybody remembers from their animated opening, kind of survived intact when they made it on the Flintstones, also animated. Movie stars made their appearance on the Flintstones. We had Alfred Hitchcock in the season, second season of Flintstones appearing as, um, I forget what his name was. It wasn't Hitchcock Stone or anything. It was something bizarre. Everybody remembers the debut episode in 1963. Anne Margaret became Anne Margrock, and she had this to say, explaining why she didn't have a repeat performance as Anne Margaret. She says, you know, the Flintstone producers begged me to reprise the role of Anne Margrock, but I couldn't because of my schedule. I was disappointed. I loved everything about her. Every Halloween, I open the door, and the kids look astonished and say, lady, are you Anne Margrock? Basically, in 1963, her big success was Bye Bye Bird, and that's what led to this appearance. My all-time favorite Flintstones episode, hands down, has to be the James Bond spoof known as Jade Bond Rock. This had, to me, all the elements that made the Flintstones great. It had a great spoof. It had the classic funny line in which the boys are sent out to get Bronto burgers and buns. Every time they get knocked out by the bad guys, one guy goes, Fred goes, I was just out to get Bronto burgers, and then Barney falls and some buns. <laughs> that was pretty funny. Anyway, Dr. No, of course, was Madam Yes, and that was a great episode. In 1965, last season of Flintstones, everybody remembers Stoney Curtis, flush from his Spartacus success. This was so successful that it even warranted an article in TV Guide. And here we have a, a shot of Tony, Tony Curtis recording voice with longtime Hanna-Barbera uh, voiceman Dale Messick. The TV Guide had a very bizarre relationship with the Flintstones. I mean, on the one hand, this was their first cover story in July of 1961 after the first season concluded. Yet earlier in that year, they had an editorial, a review of the Flintstones by Gilbert Seldes, in which he said, 
Starting a few feet above low water mark, the Flintstones had moved steadily in one direction, downward. And he concluded by saying, I never felt that I had to defend each program offered, but the Flintstones is going to make life hard for me. I cannot fall back on the consolation that such programs do no harm. They do harm. They put over the second and third best on people who want the best. So long as the Flintstones exist, some people will turn them on. It's better than nothing, but only the least bit better. And yet here they are in a cover story in which they go on to say that the Flintstones have become a milestone because by opening up the door to nighttime adult sophisticated animation, they open the door to all these cartoon characters, other Hanna-Barbera creations, Top Cat, the Jetsons, things that follow the Flintstones' success. None of them were as big a success as the Flintstones, unfortunately, for Hanna-Barbera. One of the big successes, though, that got a boost from this article was our Rock and Bullwinkle, who were moved to prime time in 1961 after the success of the Flintstones. Now, the Mad Peck, who's a cartoonist, had a syndicated strip in the Village Voice a couple years ago, this week in TV history, and he talked about this, but he concluded his strip by saying this, another dig at the Flintstones. Damn it, why can't I get great writing like that for my show? Because of the sophistication of the Rock and Bullwinkle writing. Now, what is it that everybody had a problem with about the Flintstones? They criticized the animation for being choppy, they criticized the scripts, but hey, they're missing the point of what the Flintstones was about. What was the downfall of the Flintstones? According to the big writing, in my opinion, it was when Pebbles was born. The birth of Pebbles, which was seen here in an article again in TV Guide, was the biggest television birth since the birth of Little Ricky a couple years earlier by Lucille Ball. But this was really all about the crass commercialization of Pebbles and Bam Bam. That basically was really designed for. Um, Ideal Corporation manufactured a quarter of a million Pebbles dolls. The dolls and the sidelines were expected to, to bring in $20 million to Hanna-Barbera's uh, checkbook. And according to Bill Hanna, he said the series will change considerably with the addition of a whole new set of jokes. Well, what were those jokes? Well, a scant eight episodes later, we had the birth of Bam Bam. What did the birth of Pebbles and Bam Bam do for the Flintstones? What were these new jokes great scripts? What did it do? It ruined the Flintstones. It reduced Fred and Barney and Will and Betty to appendages of their kids. All the scripts were all about their kids now. I mean, hey, Will and Betty did housework before um, Pebbles and Bam Bam were born. They were always using their prehistoric inventions to do the dishes and do the wash. But that's not what I'm talking about. When, Will, when, Betty, when Bam Bam and Pebbles were born, Wilma and Betty kind of lost their character. I mean, before the babies, Wilma and Betty were funky. They were hip. They used to dress up. They used to get down. They had a real character about them. I mean, look at them here. They, they would go around. They were parading around, getting dressed up in ruby little outfits. And let me tell you something. They were no pushovers. Wilma could pack a wallop when she wanted to. And even demure little Betty, when she had to, could really let Barney have it. But hey, once the babies were born, Wilma and Betty became ciphers. They lost the best parts of themselves. One of the ways you can see this is in the music of the Flintstones. In the last season, you had this horribly dreadful song called Let the Sun Shine In. Compare this to, you know, rock roll doing the twitch by Fred. You know, there's a town I know where the hipsters go called Bedrock. Now, this is totally different from what came later. By the last season of Flintstones, the kind of TV parodies they would have would end up just being promotional bits for ABC's own shows. The, the Munsters became the Gruesomes. The whole show was kind of dumbed down. It was made more infantile. The, the possibly the nadir of this whole thing was when they had to go otherworldly for these so-called new jokes that the bears bring when the great gazoo came from another planet. The, the saving grace of gazoo was that he was voiced by the great Harvey Corman. Once again, at TV Guide, we have a barometer for how the Flintstones ended up ending their network run when they ran a cartoon called The Older Generation, and the bottom strip has this disgruntled woman watching TV with her husband, and she says, if a rating service calls, you can be the one to tell them we're watching the Flintstones. So in six years, we went to a show that everybody was talking about because it was a sophisticated adult show to show that everybody was embarrassed to admit they were watching because it belonged on Saturday morning. After the run of the Flintstones, 
They did release a movie that was kind of a James Bond spoof, but it basically did nothing in 1966. And then in 1967, Hannah Barbera were contracted to produce a promotional sales film for Anheuser-Busch in 1967. All I can say is, get ready for this. I edited this down from a much longer half-hour segment. Shortly after man learned how to cultivate grape, he learned how to brew beer. Hieroglyphics tell us that as far back as the year 1967 BA, many thousands of years ago, the man who enjoyed beer then drank it for much the same reason as the beer drinker today. Continuing with it, we are strengthening it with another powerful expression. 
when you're due for a beer, bush does it. Now to show you what we mean. Let's take a look at one of our new television commercials. debuted and Bill Griffith who created the character Zippy the Pinhead was one of the underground uh, comics sort of founding fathers and in 1979 he did a strip uh, about his character Zippy the Pinhead who's kind of a non sequitur mouthing um, pinhead and in a strip in this particular issue in 1979 he has Zippy kind of washed up on shore and he looks up and who does he see on the shore but Wilma and Betty. And now in 1979, this is sort of like the first kind of postmodern use of the Flintstones. I mean, the way Griffith drew them, he sort of had this sort of like cubist kind of thing going on here. And that is something he had, um, he had the Flintstones lead them to the Holiday Inn. Now in many ways, this sort of presaged what we later saw happen to the Flintstones, which carries to this day, is basically the merchandising. That's how the Flintstones has survived. Here's a promotional thing for days in. But it was this feature, the way that he captured them, that probably influenced Kenny Scharf, uh, the most noted of the fine artists to do the Beatles, uh, the Beatles, <laughs> the Flintstones, sorry, wrong pop culture reference there. Um, this led to other artists interpreting the Flintstones. An underground artist named Zeno ended up doing this image that we saw at the top of the show. And the Flintstones has survived to this day in other forms. There's actually a whole bunch of Flintstones kind of theme parks that are not really done with Hanna-Barbera's approval, but they kind of let these things exist. But there's a couple of them in Vancouver, of all places, uh, one in South Dakota, that's where this is, and then one, I think, in, in uh, Kansas City. But the biggest influence of the Flintstones that can be found is basically still on television. I mean, when Fred was revealed on the original series to be a high school football player, Twinkle Toes Flintstones, what does that survive in but Al Bundy of uh, Married with Children, who was always talking about the four touchdowns that he scored for Pokai. Where else can we see Fred's influence in another Fox series? Homer Simpson? Simpson, Flintstones, Simpson, you know, same thing. In fact, Matt Groening paid a little homage to Flintstones when, in the very famous couch gags, every time the Simpsons come in, there's something else happening on the couch. Well, there was a Flintstone homage uh, a year ago. And another animated series where we can see the influence of the Flintstones, Ren and Stimpy. I mean, if you take Stimpy, he can make whatever kind of gross-out face he wants, but Fred was the original master of the gross-out face. And if he was Stimpy, well, that makes Barney Ren. <laughs> so in the end, what is the appeal of the Flintstones? What is it that we love about them? It comes down to, of course it has to come down to, 
the humans who voice them. These are some of the greatest voice actors in television history. Bea Benaderet, everybody remembers, of course, she is, she is the ideal Betty. Midway through the series of the Flintstones, she left the show because she had to play Kate, who uh, ran the Shady Rest Hotel Petticoat Junction. Um, but she was the best Betty when she was replaced by a cipher named Jerry Johnson, who has a nondescript voice, but again, it pretty much suited what Betty had become, a cipher. But it's B. Ben and Derrick who had the classic, you know, bang, that kind of voice that we love. Mel Blanc, of course, he was the voice of Bugs Bunny and all the great Warner Brothers characters. He too, like B. Ben and Derrick, is deceased. Jean Vanderpahl is still alive. She was the voice not only of Wilma, but Pebbles. I don't know if anybody realizes that. And what is really the centerpiece of the Flintstones? What is at their heart? Well, it's Alan Reed himself, who was Fred Flintstone. I mean, not only was he a great Fred Flintstone, I mean, he kind of even looked like him a little bit, but he was as great of a Fred Flintstone as Ralph Cram as Jack Gleason was Ralph Cramden. I mean, he passed away in the early 80s. He was replaced by a voice actor named Henry Corden, who does a credible job, just like the replacement for Mel Blanc. But nobody, nobody will ever take the place of Alan Reed, and it is his voice and his characterization of Fred Flintstone that will remain for the ages. Anyway, that brings us to the end of my presentation.